Okay, so we're about to begin an interview. Uh, we're in downtown Montreal, in the Sheraton, during the United Steelworkers Conference. And uh, to begin, could you please state your full name? Sure, my name is Marty Warren, and I work for the United Steelworkers. I'm the District 6 Director, which is responsible for Ontario and Atlantic Canada. And where were you born? I was born in Barrie, Ontario, but I grew up uh, a majority of my life shortly, uh, about six months into my life. My parents moved to Kitchener, Ontario, so I uh, was raised in uh, most of the, my whole life in Kitchener, Ontario. And uh, when you were a child, what did your parents do for a living? My dad was a, a iron worker. He did a lot of structural steel. And my mom, like most women in the day, our wives in the day, women in the day, my mom didn't enter the workforce until we were off to school, and she worked at support staff um, for in a uh, community college. Okay. And uh, you as a child, what were your interests or your hobbies? I was pretty much like any kid growing up. Uh, not a whole lot of interests in terms of, I wasn't a science guy or anything, but, uh, you know, hanging out in the street, quite frankly, hockey was a big part of my life, whether it was road hockey or falling hockey or playing hockey. So if anything, I would say hockey. And, and then back in the day, you know, we didn't have all the electronic stuff. Mm -hmm. So we were out in the, between hide and go seek and hanging out and driving bikes and stuff like that. So, and just pretty typical. Right on. And at school, um, did you start focusing on more of a, a specific strength or interest? Well, actually, yeah, in school, as I kind of came up and more through in high school, started to focus on more of a business type degree or heading in business. I thought um, that was always exciting to me. And then I watched a, a video at one point. It was probably, uh, I was out of high school, probably doing a little community college, but I watched a, a, a movie called um, The Final Offer, and it was a, a movie put together by then president of the auto workers, um, uh, White, Bob White, and it was, and it showed kind of real uh, high-level bargaining with the big three auto industry in Canada. It was a documentary that was put out years later, and that really kind of attracted me uh, somewhat to kind of the labor side of business. And uh, so, anyways, that's uh, if anything, that's probably what I focused on. I was my dad was an iron worker, so when I came out of high school, I went to college for a couple of years of just basic stuff, and then. Uh, he got me into the trade, so I was a unionized iron worker. And for about three years, I did that with apprenticeship school. And then there was a huge recession in about, uh, say, 82-ish. And it was very difficult to find work. So ultimately, what I decided to do is there was a, a rubber factory. It was a BF Goodrich tire plant in Kitchener. And I decided, uh, we were very fortunate in Kitchener. It was once a very industrial place where... There was auto plants, many of them. There was the furniture, there was meat processing, and one, and we had two actually tire plants. So I had decided then that uh, the trades were slowing down, and I was trying to kind of get my life together in terms of buying a house or what I was going to do. And one thing about the trades at that point, you could make $2,000 one week and nothing for two weeks later. So ultimately, I went into this tire plant, this BF Goodrich tire plant, for one summer and uh, spent 20 years there. Oh, wow. Mm. Yes. And um, did you get involved with the union right away? Once, once yes. So when I started there in 84, it was very shortly thereafter, probably by the end of my first year that I got involved in the union, there was an individual that was there. And we talk about it in the labor movement, about finding a mentor, or somebody that, that's already established in the labor movement, reaching back and helping you through or bringing you forward. So there's a fellow there named Lee Messenger, and he was instrumental in kind of encouraging me to become a uh, a union steward and kind of what we say, kind of going through the ranks of the union. So by 85, I was uh, a uh, union steward, and it was a 1,100 uh, tire plant place, so fairly big. We had full-time officers and what have you in terms of local union. And then probably by 89, uh, in the early 90s, I was on the executive board, and then by 91-ish, uh, the vice president, and by 96 or so, the president of the local. So I did come up through the ranks, absolutely. Okay, like it seems to be a recurring theme for most uh, yeah. presidents or directors. Yeah, you kind of you kind of get, uh, and, and that always amazes me what we do, because 
a lot of the people you see, uh, activists we call them in the labor movement or, or leadership, are people that no matter what workplace they were in could probably, for lack of a better word, survive on their own or find their way through it. But we always laugh within our activism and our movement that what makes us step up and want to lead and kind of helps uh, help working people every day. One neat thing, whether it's at a plant level or, or what I do today, it's a very honorable work. It's frustrating and it's uh, a lot of time there's a lot of conflict in it. But at the end of the day, you get to wake up every day and try to help working people or help your colleagues or your brothers and sisters in the plant that you may work. So uh, for some reason, activists uh, tend to do that. or we're, We always wonder what we have that some don't, but that's uh, what a lot of us have, that wanting to help. Did you get into that um, that line of work because of your father or... Or was that part of an influence? Uh, yeah, no, I, I think it was definitely my father being a a union iron worker. Now, my dad was never held in office. My dad um, was, uh, I don't believe, ever a union steward. But my dad knew that the trade union movement, his union was a big part of being able to provide for our, our family. And uh, so we lived in Kitchener, as I had said. And his union meetings, he came out of Hamilton 731, I believe his local number was. And my dad, and we talk about our members going to membership meetings. So my dad would have had an hour drive to go to his membership meetings. And if my dad was probably anywhere within three hours of Hamilton, never missed a union meeting at all. So when I grew up, I had a real sense that a union was something that helped uh, my dad and helped him with security. Uh, having wages that ultimately helped us um, him raise a family and give uh, us opportunity. And, and on top of that a little bit, just the other thing I should say uh, about my father, and, and it kind of comes from the trade union side as well, around his politics. My dad loved politics, loved watching the news. And my dad was a staunch NDPer. So for many years when I was young, I'd hear this Ed Broadbent guy, this name being mentioned, Ed Broadbent, Ed Broadbent, and blah, blah, blah. For many years, I thought he was an uncle or part of the family until later I grew up to find out that uh, he was a, an NDP leader. So I got my politics kind of from my father as well, from just years of years of hearing him talk at the table and uh, the discussions and watch the news. Do you remember back in the day when, I guess when you were a child, or at least when he was still at work, what the big issues were for, for him and his work? Yeah, for him, a lot of it was health and safety. I mean, at the time, health and safety drove the agenda a lot. Um, and, and as well as just in that day, it was a uh, rate of pay. They were making some real movements on rate of pay at that time. They were paid well. A travel time when you were away from your family, that you were reimbursed for travel time and lodging. So a lot of just the basic stuff that uh, we take granted uh, uh, granted of as the next generation. And I'll backtrack a little bit and say when I started at the tire plant, I mean, I walked into a collective agreement that was, you know, an inch and a half thick, if not two inches thick. It had a pension plan. It had benefits. It had cost of living. It had great vacation stuff. And again, the sense that, you know, if I didn't know my some of my history, you would think the employer gave it to, to us. But ultimately, what we find out, or when she learned, or through my dad, I found out that somebody before me, them are hard-fought rights that I know we had a strike in the 70s over cola. So for me to walk into that tire plant and have cola, that's because some other generation took that on as a struggle in a fight, potentially lost a home, lost money during it, but that's what they did. So um, anyway, so with uh, my, my father, I did get a sense that for sure it was around job security as union and feeling part of deciding the future. He had a voice. And throughout your career, what uh, what would you consider to be your biggest fight or, or difficult project or um i think right now throughout the career i've been very blessed with a lot of great people that have mentored me i have had given, given a lot of opportunity and i know it takes that step to walk through the door with opportunity but, but great mentors but today one of the some of the battles that i see us facing are somewhat around the, our ability to grow uh, the union and have the next generation or next gen or the millennium group understand that um, unions, the trade union movement, are the framework for working people to advance. And the example I'll give is, 
I was sitting at a, at a video put on for our 70th anniversary. And, um, and what I learned from that video is if you look at history and they, they say history kind of repeats itself. And I was sitting there and you've seen what working pay people faced in the 30s and 40s until they were, and yes, the Industrial Revolution was starting at that time as well. But what they found out was the distribution of wealth is almost like it was today. There was the working poor and the extremely rich back in the day. And what I took from that video was, wow, look what history teaches us. If we come together as working people, if we re reunite, uh, or unite in terms of solidarity or through the trade union movement, you know, through from the third, 40s on, it was kind of the birth of what we now refer to as the middle class. It was where working people were coming together through the labor movement to negotiate better working standards, better rights, and better pay and pension plans. Um, so one of our struggles that I think we find today in, in the new kind of world is it's changed a little bit to be, and I don't want to say this negatively, but it's a bit of a me world now. If I'm doing okay, the heck with my neighbor. So that's one of the challenges we face where it's kind of a uh, long as I'm doing okay or if you have a pension plan and I don't, you shouldn't have one. Instead of the idea of if you have one, how, why don't I have one? So I think one of our battles and I'm so proud of the steelworkers with this next gen program they've got is we're trying to find ways and understand our next generation to be the next generation of leaders, connect with them teach them our history and if history repeats themselves we have achieved so much as working people in terms of coming together behind uh, whatever union it may be the steelworkers union the labor movement as a whole so that's one of the biggest challenges i find is reaching out to the future generations the next generations to explain to them that this is fragile what we have today and there's a tax on our movement on our union every day from you know the rich conglomerates and uh, governments that lack the willpower to protect us and that it's so important that they take their union and be part of it and participate and, and the nurture it and fight for it so that's one of the biggest struggles we face today as well as the next thing that we face i'll say there's two right now in terms of you know going forward is our ability to grow the the union movement you know, we have legislation that, at, 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 that has been written basically by the corporations where in Ontario, for example, that even when you get X amount of cards signed, they still have a week to intimidate the workers before the vote. The vote happens at the workplace. And so our ability to grow the union with the legislation in place, and again, our, our at this point, inability to connect at certain levels with some of the next generation and say, the media has done such a good job at it's, it's the union's fault, it's their fault, but really without us, you know, we wouldn't have had the 30s to the 80s, you know, them prosperous times. And I believe too that the thing that everybody's got to come to grips with, whether it be through organizing and coming together to better off everybody's lives, um, or to be involved in your union that really at the end of the day, we're the last ones pushing back. I can tell you that Canada today, the U.S. is difficult in some of their struggles as it is. Without the labor movement still pushing back, there would be no resistance. And that doesn't mean we win at all, but at least there's another voice to be heard. Mm -hmm. So uh, would you say the United Steelworkers today in the continent is slowing down its rate of membership? Or oh. you're saying it's a challenge, so is that... Not that it's shrinking, but it is, is it expanding slower now? Yeah, no, no, there's no doubt about it. One of the things that the, the labor movement faces as a whole, as well as the steel workers, is to continue to grow our union and to bring people in. It creates us in, in sectors, it creates leverage and, and strength in bargaining as we bring sectors in, and the world's changing. I mean, we have to acknowledge that uh, some of this strong uh, industrial revolution that I just talked about, that created a lot of the labor movement. Them jobs are uh, wrongfully and shamefully uh, being exported overseas with uh, poor trade deals and no protection. So yes, we are losing, we have lost jobs, our members, and, uh, and the, the economy is growing in different sectors. An example, the security sector is a huge growing sector. And we've got about, in District 6, about 9,000 members in it. 10 years ago, we wouldn't have, or 15 years ago, we wouldn't have had. But as the economy shifts, job shifts, you know, it's important that we try to continue to keep our union strong, build our membership, and find ways to help those that, that, that need a union. Mm -hmm. Now, today, you were talking about 
outsourcing. There's outsourcing internationally, but there's also outsourcing within the country. For example, um, if the union has a, I don't know, it has a unionized um, hydro company, many of the things they can do within that company can be contracted out, I guess. Uh, are there, do you see any issues um, or does, do the United Steelworkers have often encounter issues with this outsourcing or this, where they have to deal with sometimes groups who work for the companies that they represent that aren't represented at all or that are represented by another union? Yeah, well, there's no doubt about it as most employers attempt to um, take less responsibility for their for their employees, which or have less of them, I guess I'll say. Outsourcing is a huge issue, whether they be contracting work out or, or not buying their supplies or some of the raw materials from down the road. They're outsourcing them overseas. So as we bargain at a lot of our bargaining tables, one of our major issues traditionally is around contracting out, contracting out and what work should stay in-house and when is there the need to contract out. And then you see that competition even play out at a different level. That's at a plant level. Historically, at one time, if I worked for Company X, we used to compete against Company B for you know the marketplace. More and more, our members are being faced with if we're on with Company X, that we've got to compete with their Company X in Mexico, their Company X in Russia, their Company X in in uh, in Indonesia, and that's where the investment dollar is going. So when these trade deals take place, if there's not a level playing field, that let's be frank, we can't compete at three dollars an hour. But at the end of the day, people got to understand or come to want to figure out what does Canada look like. What do you want Canada for your kids and grandkids? Who are we as a nation and what do we believe in? So if we believe in a, a, a that everybody should have an opportunity to work, raise a, own a home, raise a family, retire in dignity, we go right back to these trade deals. Not only do you got to be very cautious, it's a global economy, accept that, they're going to happen, but trade deals that work for Canada or North America. Um, trade deals that, that uh, protect some of our sectors. I mean, we're facing right now in the steel industry, three of our big steel in industry plants are in CCAA, the verge of not having steel plants. Now there's some others in Canada, but these are three big players or three big plants. And we're, 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 having, we're on the verge of losing them in Canada, possibly losing them. And I ask you as this grows, what's a nation without a steel industry? How do you have a strong infrastructure without a steel industry? How do you support the auto industry without a steel sector? The steel uh, sector in Ontario, or sorry, in Canada, supports 20,000 jobs and 120 um, indirect jobs. And they're all relatively paid well. And, when that, that's not, and what that means is strong communities. You look at Sioux, you look at Nanco, you look at Hamilton. This is more about than just the plant and the workers themselves. It's the communities we build around them and the ability to have health care and pay um, pay for the schools. So um, anyway, so there's there's that there's that level of competition as well. And until we find a way to have trade deals that are in uh, workers best interest and most importantly, the trade deals we can sign are one thing, but then have the rules of engagement for enforcement. I mean, as far as I understand it, a lot of the times in the U.S., at least the unions can raise issues around poor trade deals, which we're not even entitled to in Canada. But there has to be so much damage done before we win the trade case that you think, oh, really? So we've now won the trade case, but we just lost, you know, 40,000 more jobs. So I just think the offshoring of jobs, the global economy um, isn't working for Canadians, isn't working for our next generation. And we need to somehow fix it to level the playing field for working people. Let me ask you this. is a recurring theme in um, a lot of the interviews I, I've done through the past year. And that's, it's kind of seen as a shame that a lot of these natural resource companies, especially if we look at the mining industry, that are now no longer Canadian, been bought out, or no longer exist. But if you look at you know, Stelco, Defasco, all these, mm. these big companies, Steel, yeah. for example, um, but also companies now that still exist but are now owned by Rio Tinto yeah. or uh, Valet. Valet or ArcelorMittal. Mm. Yeah. Um, so, how to? What's your take on that from a labor? No, I, I think I think the point on having uh, foreign takeovers overs of once were Canadian operations, be it the mining sector, is very troublesome. 
I mean, the ship has left the, the port now, but we do see a huge difference. These are conglomerate companies that uh, they operate in many different comp and countries. And at one time, if it was a Canadian operation in a Canadian community, they played a part in the community. A lot of the HR people lived in the community. They supported the community. Now I believe the more and more, whether it's the Rio Tintos, the, the Valleys, the, the US Steels, the, the SRs, that it's a different playing field because they don't have the, the stake, the skin in the game as the working people do in the community. I mean, somebody in some other location will make a decision on investment. We now know that a lot of these bigger corporations, they'll move their upper management every two to three years because they don't want them having relationships with the workforce and getting connected and wives, get, and, wives and husbands getting to know each other. They don't want that. So I, I think that, that thing of uh, having uh, so many industries taken over by foreign uh, companies is troublesome at the heart for sure. Um, now, could you speak a bit about the 1995 uh, merger of United Steelworkers with the rubber, United Rubber uh, Workers? Yeah, so in uh, 1995 we, we merged with the Steelworkers and I can tell you we were a very proud union. We were the United Rubber Workers and at one time probably uh, just entire plants alone 500,000 members just in producing in the tire sector. And uh, by 1995, uh, a lot of the ch companies were starting to head overseas. Uh, we've seen uh, Firestone, which was an American company bought by a Japan company, Bridgestone Firestone. We've seen the BF Goodrich plant that I came bought by Michelin, a France-owned company. And so what uh, took place there is we were in really tough bargaining with uh, Bridgestone Firestone. Us as a plant in Kitchener, we were at the bargaining table with Michelin at the time. And we didn't because again, from job loss, offshoring, plants being shut down, we didn't have the resources to take on this world, these conglomerate companies as the United Rubber Workers. We're very fortunate that we went to, uh, you know, the discussions happened and uh, we were going to merge with the Steelworkers Union. We had uh, a conference on that to join them. And I can tell you, all the Canadians that came from Canada to go down as delegates to vote supported the merger. We were excited. And as I said, we were at the bargaining table then when this was going on. And we went from a Michelin company that thought they were going to attack us and take us on because they quite frankly knew that our strike and defense fund had, I believe, $16 million in. Back in the day, I believe the steelworkers had $160 million in. And today that's up around $360, $340, something like that. But when we came back after the merger convention, the attitude from the company changed and we were able to, uh, to reach a collective agreement. So, so the history personally for me has been a wonderful experience and I got to tell you there's never been probably a better merger than I I believe is is the rubber workers able to join the steel workers and at that point the steel workers were really starting to do a lot in, in the global economy, global allies and that was so important in the industry I came out of because as I said these companies now were worldwide companies, they weren't just US companies or Canadian companies. The other thing I'll tell you that was going on, there was once an auto pack and you basically had to have so many uh, plants in Canada if you want to sell tires in Canada type deal and, and as these went away and as the, as the uh, offshoring started to happen from a society or a Canadian economy that once had a tire plant from every company in and somewhere in Canada I came out of an area with two or three tire plants they're all gone now they're all gone I think there's one Goodyear plant and uh, two Michelin plants left down east but um, bottom line is and I'll say this till, till I pass they use the money in North America to build, to make money off us, to set up their plants overseas and then shut us down. And you can put a lot of tires on a boat. So it's a huge struggle for, for us, right? A sector that we still have some, some members, quite a few members actually in the US and uh, uh, we're doing a heck of a time protecting them. And you'll see if you look, one of the reason, ways we're protecting them is constantly having to take on trade cases from the offshoring dumping of tires. Now, uh, if we can move on, just a few social yeah. questions. Um, first one is uh, the presence or absence of women. 
Jeff and ask people, and, and this would be more regarding um, the United Steel workers or mm -hmm. your, your experience in, in uh, labor. And uh, so throughout your career, how present or absent have uh, women been and how has that changed? Yeah, no, and I think it comes, uh, I'm going to talk about my personal experience and, uh, and I think it's somewhat reflective of what was had been going on in the time. So I come out of a tire plant. I started in 1984. They didn't hire a woman in that tire plant until 1990. So you could see the 40 year history of where women for whatever reason weren't hired in a tire facility because you had to be this size and this strong and blah, blah, blah. So, um, and I think that was the same in some of a lot of other sectors which, uh, you know, wasn't the way to do it and there was no need for it, but for some reason it was seen as the norm then. Yeah, like mining. For the longest time, women yeah, mining would, would, be, would cause disasters if they went underground. Right? Yeah, it, it, exactly. And then it was, uh, as you see in the introduction, a lot of the manufacturing and the resource sector of women being hired. I, I believe that um, I can tell you the steel workers for sure, and most most um, other unions are, are, are trying to kind of catch up. It's hard to make up for 30 years, but I can tell you, through our women's committee action. I mean, I just came last month from an international women's conference with a thousand women from all over our union, um, you know, leaders, leaders in their locals, and um, as well as some of the stuff we do in the district around women's committees throughout the district, our district six women's committee, you know, that we support it. And these are women from all different sectors that uh, come together to kind of continue to push um, for, women's issues, women's rights, but more importantly what I've told them, and sometimes under, we have a very historic structure, right? And it, some of it are elected positions, but I always tell um, women in our union that, you know what, if women over time would have just waited till it was given to them, they wouldn't have got it. You need to reach out and get it, and I'll do whatever I can to support you achieving your goals. So I try to tell, tell women, don't be pushed back. Don't say, well, that we don't do that, or that's not what we did. Challenge, challenge, challenge. You were never given anything. Get up and take it. So anyways, I can tell you that more and more women uh, are entering, you know, are being involved in union. Do we have as many as we want? Absolutely not. I can tell you, and this probably doesn't play out well, but here's a reality. In today's world, women still re uh, rear the kids more than men. Not always. And I understand two people are juggling jobs and what have you, but ultimately we find, and I think the statistics would show it, women are, are more likely to get involved in their union, probably in their mid to late 30s or early 40s, where men ha have historically got involved in their union probably in their early 20s. So, and that's just that society thing. I'm not saying that always happens, but if you see a lot of women, they say, you know what, I'm going to do the secure thing with my kids for a while, going to get involved in the union, but wait till they get more onto school or whatever. So I think we, them are some barriers that we've got to figure out and at events is a daycare that we offer. But I do tell you that, um, in our, in our union, and if you do surveys, sorry, you do surveys, women are more opt to join a union than a man is. And so there, there's a, a lesson to be heard there why we need women in our union and leaders in our union. And I always tell the story. I'm an honorary member on our district's women's committee from years ago when I was an activist. And I always kid them, you pick 10 men, I'll pick five women and we'll kick your ass. <laughs> nice. <laughs> now, um, uh, I, al I also ask this question. I don't know if you've worked a lot with uh, Aboriginal communities, but... Um, if that ties somehow to uh, some companies or some cases uh, you've worked with, um, and if if you can tie it to the natural resource uh, sector, I don't know if you. Yeah, yeah. So, that, so I historically not, not I have not a whole lot of experience uh, working with Aboriginal communities, but since I've been director, I've been very fortunate. We just had a, our conference at the Sioux, and at the Sioux, um, there's uh, several communities up there. Uh, and we were able to bring them, invite them, learn from them, share ideas with them, let them know who we are, as well as I recently. So we are starting to make those connections. We want to make those connections. But we don't want to be seen as just the union is there today because um, there's a resource uh, up the road that we're looking to have a part of. 
that's not what we're about. It's been, and I'm coming to it late. I can tell you the steelworkers have had relationships for years. District 3, we've done some wonderful stuff in, in District 3. Kenny Newman might have talked about a huge summit we just had, I believe, in Winnipeg, where we brought Indigenous and, and, and Aboriginal people in from all over to, to share experiences, learn from each other. Recently, I was in uh, Voises Bay. It's our valley operation and we do impact agreements there and we, uh, we're starting to really have a great relationship with our Inuit and Inuit folks there to try to work together to challenge some of the things that problems they're facing and the problems that we face because we see a lot of our values or what we're trying to achieve um, for working people broadly or for them what they're trying to achieve uh, with their communities. Uh, we can work together and they mirror a lot. So I don't have a whole lot of experience. Uh, I'm learning as we go, but I'm excited about the future because I think on so many levels, we are starting to connect and see and have each party understand the goals. And I think we have so many values together that I think our future is bright working together. Since the beginning of your career and, and looking at it today, uh, what what issues you consider have been pretty much solved? you know, that, that really have been or eradicated in a way? Wow, you know, um, problems eradicated. I, I sometimes, or close. Or, or close. I'm not, um, I'm not sure. Um, that's a great question. I'm not sure the answer because I'll tell you why. And I, I go back to my mom. My mom say, says everything goes in a cycle, Marty. So at times I think we may have thought we've eradicated certain issues within the workplace. Um, but then they seem to come back in different forms and whatever. So uh, one example would be that we really are proud as a union and as a steelworkers union and in health and safety and, and how we've brought that to, to, um, to our members and to communities. And, but then when you stop there, you think the trouble we're having with our Westray legislation and yet a CEO hasn't you know, done jail time yet. We have a re the recent year ruling that one may go to jail. All the work we've had to do in Stop Our Killing campaign over the last several years where we've looked back at the legislation and said, the legislation is written perfectly, but it's around enforcement. So um, I'm not sure there's anything that we can say that we've really accomplished and that won't come back. Because I can tell you at one time, we had, you know, with harassment and dis discrimination, we do so much work in that area, but it's still a problem. It's a new problem called bullying. It's the cyber side of it. You know, violence against uh, women still exists. So I, I think it's pushing the yardsticks forward. I mean, in terms of some simpler issues, maybe not social issues, over time on certain days, stat holidays, certain level of a working environment that we can for sure have a say in the workplace your union can always provide you. Um, but I'd be hesitant to say that we could just say this is a success story and will never happen again. Mm -hmm. Because I think as we, we roll through and as the global economy changes and players change, we seem to go back to fighting some of the same fights we fought for years. Yeah. Well, like it was said, if you stop fighting, then it's when it starts to go backwards. Right? Yeah. So I guess yeah. it's always yeah. a positive struggle in a way. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, so yeah, we're we're almost done. Are there any um, any kind of big cases you've worked on or, or parts of your career that that you think are worth mentioning that we haven't? Um, no, I, Tony, no, I like, I mean, the job I do is a job of, yeah, no, I mean, I just say, uh, m maybe what I would say is one of the things that I'm very fortunate enough, as I said before, that I get to work, uh, uh, wake up every day and, and fight for social justice and working people on their behalf. And when you drill right down to it, it is kind of what, and we try to engage our rank and file members and more importantly, the public, because really what we're about, we're the leading edge of what do you want your Canada to be like? What are our values? What are our beliefs? And if these are our values and our beliefs and things we want to make sure that we have or gain for our kids and grandkids, I can tell you there's no greater organization, if any organization at all that can do it, other than the trade uh, labor movement. So uh, I just uh, hope over the next time as we engage our next gen 
and I don't know where rock bottom is, where our kids have to hit, but at some point we do rally again around this idea of coming together as working people, as citizens, to advance all our interests against uh, corporate greed or the corporate elite catches on again or becomes cool again, because I know it works. It's worked for my father. It's worked, I was very fortunate that way, and it can work in the future. So I guess I'll end it as, I'm very hopeful for a future that the kids and, and the next generation will understand how we were successful. It wasn't through individualism. It was through coming together as a group and demanding social justice. And when we tie the trade union movement in, what type of Canada do we want? I think they fit quite, quite close together and we can achieve those goals through the labor movement. And I just hope somehow, some way, and I'm positive we will engage the future generations to, to join the labor movement because it has so many uh, potentials. Speaking of that, I'll finish on that. Um, if you were speaking to someone much younger, like a student, for example, someone about to start their, you know, their career, um, and they they were thinking maybe if we can tie this into thinking of going into um, the natural resource industry slash maybe labor, um, what piece of advice would you give them? In just in terms of working there. Yeah, or yeah, thinking of a future uh, where they could get involved with mining and yeah, or unionized mining. Or something I, I like would that. tell you if, uh, and I have a son that I would, I would, you know, I do harp on him a little bit. I think uh, for Canada, uh, the mining sector is the future of our country. We do know we are a mining rich, or sorry, resource uh, rich country, and I think they, and I can tell you, uh, our that sector has done very well in terms of wages, benefits, and pension. We do know that sometimes they're remote mines and it means, you know, you know, living in a remote community or flying in, flying out. But I can tell you they're great jobs to have. They're fulfilling jobs to have. There's always the safety of element no matter what you do. And mining continues today to still be a dangerous sector, although we do wonderful things in health and safety. But I would have no issue with encouraging my son or my daughter to work in the resource sector, be it mining or, or any part of that. I think it is one of the stronger parts of our economy for the future. Well, thank you. All good? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.